Hey guys, I'm Chris Buck and everyone, welcome to Friday Fretworks. And this week, I think I've done it. I think I've finally finished my paddleboard. Said no one ever. So if you've been watching Friday Frightworks for at least the last few weeks, you probably will have noticed there's been some fairly pedalboard-centric content. I guess it's been about two months now since I put my new pedalboard together, during which time I've not only done a lot of shows with it, but travelled with it a hell of a lot. The works, planes, trains, automobiles. I guess Uber should probably be in there as well. Now for the 21st century, long and the short of it is it's been absolutely everywhere with me, during which time it's proved itself impressively reliable. Miraculously so, to be honest, given it was me that put it together, and say for one little mishap at Black Deer Festival, I made a video about that, I'll link to above, which was entirely my own fault through inadequate packaging and protection on a flight back from a festival in Zurich back here in the UK. It's been miraculously reliable as I said and now that the revolving door of pedal choice has kind of chilled out a little bit and I've really honed in on some settings, I thought now would be a good time to try and talk you through it from top to bottom. Let's take a deep breath. So the pedal board itself is made by Schmidt Array in Germany and specifically it's an SA550 XDM. That's a bit of a mouthful, but you can essentially break that down to SA, of course, reference Schmidt Array, 550, referencing its width in millimeters, and XDM, here denoting extra deep man. Essentially means you have a bit of extra available depth to fit some more pedals. Now, the previous Schmidt Array I'd been using was the SA450. Used that on innumerable tours and sessions. It was absolutely bulletproof, to be honest. It was just getting a little bit small. I wanted to fit a few extra pedals in there. Basically, consolidate the extra pedal board that I'd been using, a pedal train mini. It's a bit of an auxiliary board, I guess, for want of a better phrase just consolidate that down into one slightly bigger board. That, of course, being the 550 XDM. Now, in regards to signal chain, the first pedal that my guitar is going to see is my trusty Dunlop slash SC95, I want to say, wah pedal. I've spoken about this pedal in the past. It's a brilliant sounding wah pedal, particularly throaty in that mid-range. A particularly distinctive feature, I guess, now as a consequence of tracks like Jump In, you can really hear it on that riff, both on the album and on any live performances. The one downside of this pedal, which again I've touched on in the past, is that there is a definite gain bump when you turn it on, whether that's as a consequence of that very prominent mid-range, I'm not entirely sure, but I would be keen to investigate whether it's possible to get it modded in any way to try and chill that gain bump out. Whether that's possible or who would do that in honesty is a bit of a mystery to me though. So if you have any suggestions, please let me know in the comments below. <laughs>
out of the war pedal, we're going to be running into the Schmidt Race handy little internal patch bay. Now, to be honest, like much of the gear I'm using, I'm very much underutilizing this. You could configure it in any number of ways, whether it's effects loop or four cable method, whatever you wanted to do. But in my case, I'm using it as a very simple one in, one out. A few reasons for that. First, among which is that I don't really need anything more than that. And secondly, I guess a little bit more pragmatic is that when it comes to teardowns and setups at festivals or even your own shows where you haven't got that much time, just one less thing to worry about, streamlining that entire process really is invaluable. Out of the other side of that patch bay, we're then going to be running into a pedal which I guess I haven't actually had all that long. That of course being the 29 pedals Una. Bit of a pedal at the moment, I guess due to John Mayer's association, you can see it fairly prominently on his recent board with Dead & Company, but you can essentially think of it as a tweakable buffer, really fine tuning a few frequencies, try and give you back some of that clarity and purity or integrity of tone that you inevitably lose when you start adding in pedals to your chain. As I said, I've not had it for a great deal of time, but the time I have had it, been very impressed and it brings back that immediacy and touch responsiveness that really does feel akin to being plugged straight into the front of my amp. Crucially, this pedal also has a little effects loop built into it, which, if you see my pedal board prior, the first pedal in the chain was the Mythos Golden Fleece. Of course, a very much vintage-inspired fuzz circuit that not only really wants to be first in the chain, but definitely doesn't want to be after any buffers, never mind a pedal whose sole purpose is to be a buffer. Thankfully, as I said, the 29 pedals has a effects loop built into it, so the foot switch on the Una is essentially now acting as a foot switch for the Golden Fleece to bring that in and out of the circuit as and when I need it. Moving on from the Una, we're going to be running into a pedal which, in all honesty, I can't tell you a great deal about as of yet. It's generated a lot of speculations and a lot of questions and emails and forum threads actually I saw the other day as well. But apart from the fact that it sounds amazing, it's not really much I can tell you about it yet. No doubt the more astute amongst you will have started to put two and two together, but all will be revealed in due course. And that's pretty much all I can say about that for the time being. Moving on from the mystery pedal, running into the Airlane Drive by Mythos Effects. Now this was a collaboration between Zach and Mythos and the guys at Novo Guitars. You can essentially think of it as a dual kind of transistor overdrive. It's very aggressive and very gritty. In all honesty, the type of pedal that maybe two or three years ago really would have turned my nose up. It wouldn't have been my thing. But in more recent times, I've been really digging those more aggressive, in-your-face type overdrive pedals. I do believe this has been renamed actually more recently to the 210 Double Deluxe drive maybe I think I want to say but either way it is essentially the same pedal it's a brilliant sounding piece of kit out of this we're going to be running into the gig rig g3 now of course I was a long time g2 user but there were a few features on the g3 which convinced me to take the plunge in all honesty specifically we've got the inbuilt tuner on its screen trails which I guess was there to a degree on the g2 but it's a little bit more fully functional I would say on the g3 and specifically the real kind of big game changer for me was some MIDI functionality relating to the, how I use the HX Stomp XL and I'll come back to that in a little bit but needless to say all of those combined convinced me to take the plunge on the g3 and unsurprisingly I've not been disappointed I'm using the gig rigs model of power supply as well across the board it's never let me down in any number of circumstances with ideal or less than ideal power 
irrespective of what voltage we're running at. It's just brilliantly made stuff, down to genius and the sweetest guy on earth, which always helps as well. Of course, it's worth mentioning at this point as well that I'm using pedal patch cabling, and where pedal patch isn't being used, I'm using Evidence SIS. So high quality cabling across the board, again, just helps keep everything neat, tidy, and quiet. In the G3's loops, not much different, to be honest, to the old pedal boards. In the first loop, of course, we've got the Snaus Black Box, very much derived from a Marshall Blues Breaker. Second up, we have the Small Speaker Overdrive by Great Eastern Effects. Essentially simulates the saturation and sag that you might get from something like a Tweed Champ. The Mythos Molnir, of course, Mythos' take on the Klon. We've got the Fable Analog Man King of Tone. And then a relatively new addition, actually, in the Revival Drive Compact by Origin Effects. Been a big fan of these pedals for a long time. Here it's being used to give me a little bit more of a kind of voxy style breakup, I guess, when traditionally I'm going to be running into more Fendery clean style amps. Next up, we have the long awaited return of the Cali 76 after it was strong armed from me by Sam, our bass player. It's a brilliant sounding compressor pedal. Of course, we've got the ubiquitous EP booster handling solo duties. We've got the Moore Trelicopter handling that very choppy sound at the start of Tell Me How It Feels, at least in a live capacity. My trusty Catlin Brand Echo Rec is still not being displaced. And then last but not least, we have the Guru's Echo Sex, which is there for that warm, almost weirdly lo-fi in a way, Echo Rex style delay, albeit one of those heads. You don't actually see many of these about, although I did see Steve Lukather using one on his pedal board recently, which is kind of indication, I guess, of the fact that it is a very cool sounding delay pedal. <laughs> Out of the Gig Rig G3, we're going to be running into the Line 6 HX Stomp XL. Honestly, you can't say enough good things about this pedal. You may have noticed there's not really abundance of modulation on the board. That's because the HX Stomp XL is handling everything, whether that's certain tremolos, harmonic tremolo, delays, reverbs, choruses, any kind of weirder stuff going on. Really is an incredibly versatile bit of kit. And also, as I referenced earlier, I've got a little bit of MIDI functionality going on with that as with the G3. Basically, up and down presets being controlled by foot switches 9 and 10 on the G3. MIDI still blows my mind, to be honest. It's not something I can easily get my head around, but having specific presets for specific tracks really is going to be helpful in not having to overutilize specific presets or, you know, kind of spend time bending down cycling through presets manually. So having that extra functionality that the G3 could give me, but the G2 couldn't really was a worthwhile upgrade. Out of the back of the HX Stomp XL, I'm going to be running into the Boss RE202 Space Echo. Again, a pedal I've no doubt waxed lyrical about in the past, but to be honest, a pedal that was very much at the heart of the decision to upgrade to a slightly bigger pedal board. It's become a very much an integral part of a few specific tracks, notably that hold and kind of slightly crazy ramp function that you can hear in the live versions of Terra Firma. Very much needed that on the board, front and center, with the foot switches accessible, and ideally not off on an auxiliary board as it kind of had been where it wasn't all that accessible. Can't say enough good things about this pedal. I've got a few different presets saved on it as well for a few different types of delays. Really is an essential part of the rig. Running out of the back of that pedal, we're gonna be running into the Universal Audio Starlight, which in all honesty, 
a great sounding paddle as it is, was the one paddle on the board that I'd convinced myself might be a little bit redundant. I've got a few great delay sounds covered across numerous other pedals, not to mention the HX stomp functionality, but I spent a little bit of time digging into the UA app recently and came across a preset that I'd not heard before that I can't seem to figure how I would have got that sound out of the pedal itself. But suffice to say, really been inspired by that. It kind of part inspired a riff, which then in turn inspired a song, which is more than likely going to be on the next card in a black album. So at least for the time being, as long as that is probably going to be essential to the sound of that song, the Starlight is probably staying put. And then last but not least, we have another UA pedal, this time the Golden Reverberator. Dual function, I guess, or dual purpose. Firstly, does the best spring reverb emulation that I've ever heard. Outside of the um, spring reverb emulation in guitar rig, it's probably worth pointing out, but seeing as I'm using two Fender amps with real spring reverb tanks, I don't get a hell of a lot of use for that, but I thought it would be handy to have on the board should I end up in a situation where I'm using rented backline, where maybe the amp doesn't have a great spring reverb, or God forbid, doesn't have a reverb at all. But primarily, the UA Golden Reverberator is there for that big, cavernous, epic plate reverb that you can hear on the live versions of On My Own. I'll link to a live session we did recently where you can really hear that in its full force. But it's a little bit of a nightmare to try and control, to be honest, in certain scenarios. And it can feel a little bit unwieldy playing with that much reverb. But the payoff is that when you get it right, it really does sound absolutely ethereal and incredibly beautiful. And that's kind of it. Moving out of the Golden Reverberator, we're then going to be running into the Radial Big Shot, splitting that out to two amps. And that is pretty much the pedal board in its entirety. Yes, it is a fairly extensive setup and no doubt will draw the ire of certain commenters or viewers who just wish I would plug into a Marshall Plexi and be done with it. But in all honesty, I've kind of explained my rationale and my thought process in regard to gear and why I use specific gear, why I use so much gear in some respects. In recent video, I'm not going to cover all ground, but if I was to try and distill that down into one kind of soundbite, I guess, is that ultimately my gig, my choice. As ever, thank you very much for watching. On that bombshell, I'm going to play you out. Please subscribe at the bell icon if you haven't already. And I shall see you next week for another episode of Friday Fretworks. Cheers, guys. Take care. See you soon.